Kidney failure was once a death sentence, either from a large burn, overdose of medication, improper blood transfusion, or a genetic malformation of the kidneys. Once the kidneys began to fail, there was no treatment. Urea, normally flushed from the body, builds up to toxic levels in the bloodstream, leading to death. Today, due to one man's idea and a world war, millions of people have the chance at a future. William J. Kolf was born in 1911 in Leyden, Holland. The son of a doctor, William knew that he could never handle the sick and dying patients to follow in his father's footsteps. Instead, he had his heart set on becoming a zoo director. When his father told him that there were only three zoos in Holland, Kolf accepted his fate and went to medical school at the University of Leyden and then took an unpaid position at the University of Groningen. While at the University of Groningen, Kolf worked under Professor Daniels, who encouraged Kolf's exploration of the artificial kidney, an idea Kolf felt deeply about after he witnessed the horrific death of a young man. Kolf did not want to become a doctor because, quote, I didn't want to see people die. However, Kolf could not escape the specter of death for long. In 1938, while working at the University of Groningen, a 22-year-old man named Jan Bruning was admitted suffering from kidney failure. Kolf described Bruning's death who slowly and miserably died from renal failure. He became blind, he vomited, and it, it was a miserable death. And I, as a very, very young physician, had to tell his mother in her black dress and a little white cap like the farmers have, that her only son was going to die. I couldn't do a damn thing about it. The sight of the young man suffering prior to death prompted Kolf to find a solution to kidney failure. He believed that if he could find a way to clean a patient's blood of the excess urea that was poisoning the body and take over the function of the kidneys long enough, then the kidneys could recover and start functioning again. A predecessor to penicillin, sulfa drugs acted as the only antibiotics in the 30s and 40s and were used heavily at the beginning of World War II. However, sulfa drugs, unlike penicillin, caused kidney failure if taken in large doses. Kolf began reading books in the university's library on cleansing blood. From his research, he learned that cleansing the blood had been attempted decades before. The research previously was used to temporarily take over the function of the kidneys in animals. Kolf believed that kidney dialysis could take the place of the kidneys and allow a person to go on living. From here, Kolf experimented with building his own dialysis machine with spare parts. To test his theory, he filled a small piece of cellophane sausage casing with blood, added urea, tied the casing off, and agitated the casing by hand in a bath of salt water. He believed that the concentration of urea in the blood would diffuse from a high concentration to the low concentration in the salt water, thereby removing the toxin from the blood. The small molecules of urea could pass through the semi-permeable casing while the larger blood molecules could not. Before Kolf had an opportunity to build a larger dialysis machine, Germany invaded the Netherlands. Kolf's mentor and friend, Professor Daniels, and his wife, who were Jewish, committed suicide to escape the Nazis. Kolf refused to work under a Nazi sympathizer at Groningen, so he transferred to the small hospital in Kampen to continue his work on the artificial kidney. While in Kampen, Kolf was diverted from his work on the artificial kidney multiple times. In 1940, when the Germans bombed a local Kampen barracks, Kolf saw the need for blood and left a funeral he was attending to drive to the hospital and asked for permission to set up a blood bank. He got permission and in four days Kolf had set up the first blood bank in Europe. Kolf was against the Nazis and their actions. Throughout the war he hid over 800 people from the Nazis as patients in his hospital. At one point his family hid an eight-year-old Jewish boy in their house. No war was going to stop Kolf from saving lives. In fact, because of World War II, Kolf was able to save lives. Had Holland not been under the control of the Nazis, the artificial kidney would never have been built. Under the cloak of war, Kolf was able to have complete freedom. There was no governmental oversight or attention being paid to his experiments. Quote, At that time, if either an institutional review committee for research on human patients or the FDA had been breathing down my neck, the artificial kidney would never have been made. Never. My conscience was my only break. Otherwise, I could do what I wanted. 
but I had to explain to the patient what I was going to do, and I always did. Kolf built his first dialysis machine by wrapping cellophane sausage casing around a wooden drum that was held over a container of solution. Using an old Ford motor, Kolf was able to turn the drum without a hand crank. In later models, Kolf would use orange juice cans and washing machine parts to test the dialysis machines. The first trials of kidney dialysis began in 1943. Kolf was ready to begin clinical trials, but his fellow doctors were not convinced. Few patients were referred to him for dialysis, and those who were were in such a late stage of kidney failure that dialysizing them made no difference. Of the 16 patients whom Kolf initially treated, 15 died and the other Kolf believed would have survived even without the dialysis. Never a man to deal well with suffering and dying, the death of 15 people was emotionally draining for Kolf. Yet Kolf pushed on learning valuable information along the way. Although the patients died, Kolf noticed a decrease in the levels of urea in their blood, a sign that his invention was working. In an effort to keep his machine safe during the war, he had eight more made and distributed throughout the Netherlands at various hospitals. Kolf was forced to abandon his work on the artificial kidney in July of 1944 due to the war. Less than a year later, Kolf was able to continue his work with his 17th patient, 67-year-old Maria Sophia Stavstadt. Maria Stavstadt was a Nazi collaborator who was imprisoned prior to her hospitalization. Quote, many of my fellow countrymen would have liked to wring her neck. They urged Kolf to let her die. However, Kolf felt, quote, but no physician had the right to decide whether a patient is a good guy or not. He must treat every patient who is in need of him. After 12 hours of dialysis, her blood pressure was down and the urea levels had decreased. She was going to make it. After coming out of her coma, Maria looked at Kolf and announced, I'm going to divorce my husband. Thanks to Kolf, she did just that and went on to live another eight years. After the war, Kolf was eager to see if his work had been duplicated around the world. To his disappointment, it had not. In an effort to spread the availability to save lives, Kolf donated his dialysis machines to Ontario, New York, Montreal, and other places, receiving no payment. Kolf had not paid for the artificial kidney. Because of the war, a factory was not allowed to work for anyone but the German army. The enamel factory where Kolf had his dialysis machine built could not bill Kolf without alerting the army to their illegal activities. Additionally, Kolf felt, quote, at that time, it was thought to be unethical for a doctor to make any money on an invention. Because of the relative newness of the kidney dialysis machine, many doctors were skeptical and called the machine an abomination. Many doctors believed that no man-made machine could replace the function of a kidney, and patients who underwent dialysis for long periods of time suffered permanent damage to their veins and arteries. While at Mount Sinai Hospital instructing other doctors on the use of the machine, the hospital's administrators openly opposed di kidney dialysis. Kolf was forced to perform dialysis in secret at night in a surgical suite. Spectators would crowd the gallery to watch these rogues in action. In 1950, Kolf and his family left Holland for the United States, Kolf taking a position at the Cleveland Clinic. Between the 1950s and the 1960s, dialysis began to become more commonplace and acceptable as a treatment for kidney failure. Gone were the days when kidney disease was a death sentence. Today, one in ten American adults, more than 20 million, have some form of chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis. Kolf went on to develop artificial hearts, eyes, and ears, always looking to the future of medicine, forever inventing the next great idea. From the early idea of an artificial kidney to the clinical trials, Kolf represented a daring and perseverance that brought dialysis into the medical world. An intersection of William Kolf, World War II, and one man's horrific death brought about the turning point between when kidney failure was incurable to when dialysis was an everyday occurrence feared by none. The changes brought about by the dialysis machine reached across Europe to America and beyond, touching the lives of millions.